please give a warm welcome to Dr. Kyle Warner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, audience. This is your one chance to say hello to us and not have to type it with your thumbs to the virtual event platform, so thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Kyle Warner. I'm a program manager in the Tactical Technology Office at DARPA. Uh, I'm delighted to be up here with these, these Arctic experts for this very exciting panel on one of the least known regions of our planet. Uh, and I'd, I'd first like to frame the discussion with a, a few key points that, that I'll introduce, and then we'll introduce each of our panelists one at a time. Uh, talk about their, their expertise and why they're here, uh, and give them a few minutes to provide their remarks as well. Uh, if you haven't already logged into the virtual event platform, please, uh, we're not going to be offended if we see you on your phones. We assume that you are populating some amazing questions for us. Uh, so please go ahead and start populating uh, questions as we go. Uh, to begin with, the Arctic comprises a polar region of eight nations at the northernmost part of our Earth. And that includes Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. What we see is that unique climate and geographical features make this truly a one-of-a-kind place. As many of us know, the summers are covered with daylight and temperatures get to almost 50 degrees Fahrenheit. In the, night, in the, in the winters, they have a long, dark night of, of near darkness uh, day round. And temperatures can get down to below negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But the Arctic as we know it has changed, and it's going to continue to change at an increasing rate. On the screen, you'll see a time lapse of the dramatic change in sea ice from the period of 1972 to 2022. Arctic operations are becoming increasingly important to use strategic focus due to both Russian activity in the area as well as Chinese economic interests. These operations bring significant challenges due to three things combined. The lack of infrastructure in the area, the expansive geographic area within the Arctic, and also the extreme weather conditions. And I think we heard about that from a couple of talks earlier today. But our interests in the Arctic span a number of regions, including commerce, natural resources, freedom of access and information, situational awareness, and homeland defense. I'd like to offer three key facts, if I could, for the panel, and, and then we'll continue uh, with their remarks as well. The first fact is that the Arctic is becoming more accessible to humans. And that's driven really by two things. First, the increased physical access from climate change, reducing the amount of sea ice that's present, but also the technological advancements that are enabling more presence of humans in the cold environment. The second thing to look at is the increased accessibility that makes it geographically feasible for both companies and state actors to have more presence by tapping the vast resources that were previously unreachable in the area. Some examples of the resource and economic opportunities include biomass, seabed minerals, petroleum, <coughs> economic tourism, as well as a significant reduction in the time it takes to get from the Pacific to the European market spaces. However, this also gives us a potential of swelling of conflict, not only between nations, but also ideologies, namely conservation and progress. So a key question for our panel today is going to be, how do we balance protecting that precious part of our planet with the opportunities that we've suggested for economic advancement? And then the third piece to consider is whether you're supporting economic advancement, protecting the environment, or advancing a nation state interest, there are some shared areas of, of technological relevance. For one, technological challenges in the Arctic may span such things as search and rescue, where you may need unique vessels, robust communications, precise navigation and communications. We'll hear about that from both the RF spectrum as well as undersea. Reliable navigations and communications in the Arctic are I would suggest a key technological development that we're looking for, for not only engagement with the audience, but suggestions on, on innovation. And then maritime domain awareness. So that is understanding what's going on above, on, and below the sea surface. And that's not just from a uh, perspective of, of wanting awareness, but also understanding where the critical investments for technology are to advance those areas. But as interest in the Arctic is continuing to increase, DARPA is applying its consistent lens to create and prevent strategic surprise. And while we're executing the same mission that we have for over 60 years, to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technology to national security. To that end, the Arctic offers unique challenges and opportunities from a technical perspective, informed by the continually involving combination of the environmental, economic, and societal changes. 
So I encourage you, our audience, to please continue to, to submit questions. And uh, I'll leave it at that and start introducing our technical panelists. Uh, our first technical panelist is Dr. Larry, Larry Mayer, professor and director of the Center of Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. He's currently the chair of the National Academies of Sciences, U.S. National Committee for the Ocean Decade, uh, the State Department's Extended Continental Shelf Task Force, and vice chair of the Board of Ocean Exploration Trust. He's recently finished terms as the U.S. Arctic Research Commissioner and chair of the National Academies Ocean Studies Board. He's received honorary doctorate from Stockholm University and was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2018 and to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences in 2019. In 2020, he became the first recipient of the Walter Monk Medal for Oceano Oceanography Society. In 2021, he was elected to the Norwegian Scientific Academy for Polar Research. Uh, his research deals with sonar imaging and remote characterization of the seafloor, as well as advanced applications of 3D visualization to ocean mapping problems and applications of law of the sea issues, particularly in the Arctic. He spent more than 75 months at sea, including being the chief or co-chief scientist of 13 icebreaker expeditions to the high Arctic. So uh, I, we absolutely welcome your, your perspective, having uh, spent a significant time up there, and we look forward to your remarks. Well, well it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a lot warmer here than up, up there, I have to say. Uh, I'm going to focus my uh, comments on the technology challenges that uh, we face for science operations in the Arctic. Um, and uh, the comments are, uh, that I'll make are going to be biased by my experience as a mapper and a sometimes climate scientist. But, but I think that the solutions to the challenges that we face, or that I face, are relevant to many non-scientific problems and to a number of the issues that, that you, Kyle, raised uh, in terms of what we need to be doing in the Arctic. And just to set the scene, this is a picture of uh, Piedemann Fjord, which is in the northwest corner of Greenland. We were there on the icebreaker Odom in, in 2015 and 2019. And just to, to let you see the, the, the vastness of the area, the, the problem we face fundamentally, the ice, um, and uh, just the, the remarkable beauty and fragility of the area too, a, as you mentioned. And, and indeed, the fundamental problem we do face, along with the long distances from ports and, and sometimes very unpleasant weather, um, is the fact that despite your comment about reducing Arctic ice, which is a very real and, and very uh, serious problem, most of the Arctic is still ice covered uh, throughout the year. And we have to understand how we're going to work in that environment. And even something as fundamental as just mapping, trying to understand that, that what I call the geospatial context, looking at uh, the seafloor and, and the water column, is virtually impossible in the ice. And uh, it's critical, though, for the things that you described, for, for safety and navigation, for climate modeling. We need to understand the flow of water. We need to understand uh, the deep passages, shallow passages, hazards, geologic history, resource exploration, exploitation, uh, ecosystem habits, laying cables, pipelines. That whole issue of situational awareness, this is really the fundamental geospatial framework. And so I think to address those, we really have to look at working under the ice and thinking about truly long-range and long-endurance long autonomous underwater vehicles um, capable of operating for very, very long periods of time and for navigating under the ice. So we have the issues of power. Uh, and this is certainly, I think, up DARPA's uh, alley there. And positioning, and we'll hear some from Matt about positioning issues, and truly autonomous situational awareness for the sensors. And that's something that we're really not at yet. If I zero in on what I think is probably one of the most serious scientific challenges we face now uh, due to climate change, that's the uh, potential global rise in sea level. And if we look at what's happening now, the Greenland ice sheet is by far the largest single contributor right now to global sea level rise. Um, if we look at the uncertainty in modeling that rise in sea level, it's really based on our lack of understanding of the processes that are going on at the ice margin, and particularly under ice shelves. And so this brings it either a more difficult challenge in terms of technology. How do we get instruments underneath that ice sheet into that ice marginal zone and look at things like what the seafloor looks like there, what's coming out from the ice, understanding those processes of ice collapse that are really, really uh, accelerating sea level uh, change. And so what, in that case, we need probably long range vehicles that are hybrid, that can actually give us real time responses as opposed to a, a simply uh, autonomous vehicle. And again, a suite of uh, autonomous mapping sensors, 
uh, imaging systems, and the ability to instrument the regions themselves for long periods of time through the full year, through the full year cycle. And so the challenges we face in the Arctic are very much like the challenges we face in the entire ocean, but they're just terribly exacerbated by the presence of that ice. So let me stop there and pass it on to Matt, or pass Great. it back to you. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Our next panelist is Dr. Matthew Jetshu, who joins us from Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Jetshu completed his PhD on source localization, and in 1991, he participated in groundbreaking thermometry experiment that was able to send and detect ocean acoustic signals at antipodal distances. He's been at Scripps since then, participating in many acoustic tomography experiments with other experts in acoustical oceanography and underwater acoustics, most recently with Nansen Environmental uh, region Sensing Center in Bergen, Norway, on a transarctic acoustic monitoring system. So Dr. Jetshu's interests uh, include ocean acoustic tomography, navigation, and signal processing. Dr. Jetshu, welcome. Looking forward to some remarks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so I'm from Scripps, and many of you, most of you probably know, we're just down the hill from here. So if you want to stop by, it would be great to see you. But um, what I would like to talk about today is uh, some of the work that we've done in the Arctic and how I think it informs some of the things that uh, we're going to talk that you're interested in today. So, uh, I have a picture behind me of what I, un, how an, maybe an underwater GPS would work, and um, <clears throat> the the idea would be that you put out some the simple concept is you put out some moorings and then you have a sound source on them and you triangulate between the sound sources with the vehicle that you want to use, or you're trying to find the the solution to where you are, um, and uh, the reason. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we do. We actually do this. We put those moorings out, and we put sound sources on them, and we put hydrophones on them. And the reason I think that we can build an underwater GPS is because we, we do it already. We, we do the basic technology. So, um, uh, for example, last in, over the year 2019 to 2020, we had out uh, <coughs> six moorings in the Arctic, and, they, and we were able to span the entire Arctic. So, in other words, we sent signals from one side of the Arctic to the other side. And uh, in the, yeah, I'm not ex trying to explain this picture very much. I'm just trying to gonna say that we were able to measure the signals and we were able to actually do a pretty good job of predicting what the signals would be. And um, for our particular work, thermometry, we are interested in the differences, the small differences between the prediction and the measurements. But for navigation, um, you would be in the, the, this picture that you can see it almost fits, right? So you would be able to tell where you are. You'd be able to measure a travel time um, between uh, a vehicle and a, and a, and a mooring, say. Um, so, so the systems we build would be able to use, be used for navigation. And, uh, and so this is how GPS basically started. You have multiple uses for GPS, and that's what I think our systems could be, right? With GPS, you have navigation, they use it for, um, uh, to, to probe the atmosphere, to find out things about the troposphere and the ionosphere, and they also use it for communication because you, you send communication signals from the satellites down. And you can do all that in the Arctic um, <clears throat> with a system like this. Uh, I would also say that uh, you, you, know, uh, you, you would need multiple moorings, but even just a simple, maybe just a couple moorings would be good for Depending, you know, depending on the exact situation you're in, because you can also use Doppler to measure the bearing angle. Um, of course, I think the other important thing to remember is, whereas GPS is a global system, uh, any underwater system would be really tuned to the particular environment that you're trying to use or, or operate in. So the thing I'm showing is something that would be large scale and you'd be able to tell where you are. And, and I think actually we've demonstrated you can do it to within about 20 meters. <clears throat> but something that Larry's talking about, you want to have a navigation system under the ice. That's a different system. I think it could be done, but it's a different system, different sources. And it, it, it's, so you, you can't build a general system that fits the whole uh, Arctic or the whole globe. Um, what does that enable? It enables all kinds of things, like all kinds of floats and gliders. I think we're, there's, a, there's a talk about the Internet of Things uh, or in the ocean later, but this is the Internet of Things in the ocean underwater without access to the, the surface. Some of the challenges you have would be um, providing enough power to the moorings or what, some other way of deploying things. 
getting accurate clock signals. We use um, under, you know, atomic clocks to measure the travel times. Um, and just the time it takes, the, the commitment it takes, the long-term commitment, you have to put these things out. You remember in GPS, they, they built it and then people came to, you know, with all their toys. To, and it was, they didn't anticipate all the uses and I, I don't think we can either. So thank you. So we've heard from a couple of uh, undersea experts and we wanna make sure we're rounded out. So we have uh, an expert in the above water interface. Uh, Dr. David Abe joined DARPA in 2020 as a program manager in the MTO, Microsystems Technology Office. Prior to joining DARPA, David was the head of electromagnetic technology branch at NRL, which is the Naval Research Labs, where he led a multidisciplinary team of scientists and engineers in pursuit of basic and applied research in vacuum electronic and solid state technologies. Dr. Abe has a PhD in electrical engineering from University College, excuse me, University of Maryland College Park. And in 2014, he and his team received an Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, and Acquisition, Dr. Dolores M. Edder's Top Scientist and Engineer Award for their work on novel millimeter wave vacuum electronics amplifier, and he was elected a Fellow of IEEE in 2015. His research interests are vacuum electronics technology, high power microwave and charged particle beam devices and applications, high power millimeter wave, submillimeter wave amplifiers for sensors and communications, magnetic materials, and radiation effects on microelectronics. So all the things that the undersea people never want to touch. <laughs> uh, so Dr. Abe, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your remarks. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, so as you said, I'm at the Microsystems Technology Office, and the Microsystems Technology Office is developing computational techniques, computational hardware, components, materials, devices, um, all, up, all the way up to full systems that support a lot of the sensors and the kind of information that you would like to have. Um, for this panel, I would like to focus on spectrum dominance as the theme. Uh, the DOD and the warfighter really would like to be able to operate freely across all the domains, undersea, all the way up into space. And we would like to be able to access and use the electromagnetic spectrum across all those domains as well. And so some of the key challenges that we have to doing that um, that you've heard from, from, from the other panelists are we would like to reduce size, weight, and power and cost of front-end elements because our platforms are getting smaller, they're getting more mobile, prime power is always an issue, size and weight for, uh, for, for, the, for the packages are always getting challenging. So we would like to find ways to do that. Increase endurance for battery life, for example, um, so that we can, we can put these things onto autonomous platforms and be able to have them out for long endurance. Um, another challenge is that we would also like to be able to do a lot of information processing at the edge. This also is something that's power, power hungry. And so we have to come up with better efficiencies in order to do that. Um, in addition, we would like to increase the tactical range of all of our, of our systems. Um, that's not only to give us better surveillance, intelligence, and, and situational awareness, but also we want to have better communications, and we also want to be able to deal with electromagnetic countermeasures if we need to do that. And then finally, um, there's a, it's challenging to operate in, in, a, um, in, a congested, in a congested spectrum. This could either be to natural, re, um, natural reasons or it could also be because of, um, beca because of adversarial uh, activity. Earlier today, Dr. Tompkins mentioned the Electronics Resurgence Initiative, and this is a government, industry, academia partnership where we're trying to address a lot of those challenges that were on the previous slide. Um, as she mentioned, um, the previous elect the ERI is, has ended, but we're now starting the next instantiation of the, of the program, that's ERI 2.0, where we're continuing to work on, on those <coughs> challenges. But in addition, we've added some new thrust areas, and one of them is developing electronics for extreme environments. And so that's where it, it, it impacts the, the operations in the Arctic. Um, extreme environments can mean extreme temperatures. It can also mean radiation hardness and radiation qualification, but also power, um, high voltage and, and power systems are, are, all, are all examples of extreme environments. So that impacts in the Arctic climate and terrain. It's not just the extremes in temperature, minus 50F to to 50F in the summertime, uh, but also um, it's a highly specular environment, so it makes it very difficult for electro-optics to, uh, to see. It's also changing, so we also see uh, the, the challenges from, uh, from, from trying to navigate around a changing environment. 
In addition, because of, the, uh, of its location and with respect to the Earth's magnetic field, there's a lot of electromagnetic interference up in that, in the polar regions. And also, because of the same, for the same reason, ionizing radiation can be a challenge as well. So there, you know, it's not an accident that the aurora borealis is strong up in the, up in the polar region. So um, for all of, those, all of those reasons, it's a very challenging environment to develop uh, electronics for. So. so you need about two years to solve that, is what you're saying? I've only got two years. Well, I've got one year <laughs> left, so I only have a year left. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So, so Matt, I'm interested. Uh, you've actually created sound that's traveled around the world as, far, as part of uh, what you've done. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you see that influencing uh, other research in the area and, and how we might expand that to other operations? Um, yeah, so uh, we did do that. We did that with it a long time ago. Um, and 30 years ago, we sent sound from Heard Island in the Southern Ocean up both the East Coast and the West Coast of the United <coughs> States. It was great fun. It, it was a lot of, you know, um, I did that with Walter Monk. Many of you know he was, a, he was at Scripps Institute of Oceanography. But um, the thing we learned there was you could find the signals, but you couldn't interpret the signals. You kind of have to limit the scope of one of these systems to a, a ocean basin where the things, the singles don't get so scrambled that you are able to still uh, interpret them and, and, and use them. Um, yeah, interesting. And, and so Dave, um, as we were talking, uh, you were mentioning the, the cold weather effects on, on batteries and other things, and that's certainly something we experience undersea as well. Uh, where, where do you see that interface uh, playing into uh, maybe other domains? Do, do you have uh, advances that perhaps could help us in the undersea world? Uh, or are those battery technologies largely limited to uh, things that you play with? So a lot of the advances that we've had have always been based on material advances. And so there is, a, there is a research being done looking into new materials, new battery technologies that would be more resilient to, to extreme temperatures. Um, you know, in, in MTO, we're also looking at um, programs that are looking not only for electronics that are tolerant of extreme temperatures, but also electronics that can thrive in, in extreme temperatures. If you get things cold enough, for example, you know that resistivity goes down and so efficiencies can go up. So again, we may be able to take advantage of, of, of the extreme temperatures. At, at the other end of things, you know, for example, you would like to be able to sense jet exhaust dynamically and be able to do things there. So again, electronics that really can thrive in those environments. So, so Larry, as someone that's uh, <clears throat> spent more time in the Arctic than most service members spend in a single duty station, uh, what sort of uh, electronics and things have you experienced having degradation that's due to the, the, the location or the temperature? Yeah, we, we have several orders of, uh, of problems. Certainly, uh, the issue of batteries and cold is, is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to address that. We also, as we get further and further north, we, we're, we find problems with the GPS constellation occasionally. Um, we have issues, this is kind of one that people don't think about, but when you work near the pole, you're crossing the date line constantly. And I have yet to find the software package. <laughs> so it's Y2K that, that every year. That, exactly. <laughs> But, but, it, but it, really, it really is uh, battery, battery life. Um, we've had issue it, it, act, actually with, with solid state components too that, that just are, have never been designed to work in those temperatures. And um, transducers themselves that, that just stop working when it gets cold. Uh, interesting, and Matt, how about, how about you? Well, yeah, I was gonna ask about was uh, clocks. We, we have a lot of, to measure travel time underwater, you have to have a good clock underwater. And so we use a little uh, either quartz clock or now we're using those uh, chip scale atomic clocks, but they still use quite a bit of power. And from what I understand, those things are designed to operate at a higher temperatures to make them stable. But we have a nice stable environment in the ocean. And I think there's some chance for making them operate in, in that kind of environment and, and doing it, you know, with less power. Um, there's some folks in our office that I think yeah. you would be interested yeah. in talking to you about that. I had a question about um, how do you how do you get your data out from 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 your either your AUVs or or from from your sensor stations? So. Yeah, this, this is a, this is a, a huge issue right now. Of course, um, in terms of high bandwidth data, the only opportunities we have are in close range, either Wi-Fi and, and very short range or um, marine broadband radio, up to maybe 20 kilometers. 
but that's it. After that, we're dependent on uh, satellite mm -hmm. connectivity, which is limited. Which is spotty, and it's very limited. Right, yes. yeah, and, and it's a huge constraint. And so we have to spend a lot of time trying to compress data on the, the edge, as you say, um, and, and just get back the essential information with situational awareness. Now, we're hoping with low Earth orbiting satellites, this will, will change, um, but we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna, I'll, we'll be sending out our first vehicles uh, using a Starlink connection uh, very shortly, and next year I can let you know. If so, that so works. Dave, what, what are some limitations there that, that you're? So the low Earth orbit satellites are less susceptible to ionizing radiation because they're just further into the atmosphere, but they're not not susceptible to it, and um, you know uh, because they're meant to be cheap and relatively short lived. Um, they want to rely on COTS components, so commercial off-the-shelf components, which are largely untested for radiation and, and um, radiation hardness and radiation qualification. So lifetime may be an issue, we just don't know yet, and we need to have better ways of doing that kind of testing more rapidly. And we've seen um, that uh, the latency is much better, of course, because it's a low, sure. low Earth orbit. But I think there has been a, a situation already where uh, solar flares yes. have actually taken, physically taken down uh, satellites. I think that the, radi the ionizing radiation environment is four times worse at the poles than it is at the equator for, because of the magnetic fields. And talk to me about infrastructure. When you go up for testing, and, and uh, you, of course, spend a lot of time on ships, and um, you spend some time on, on the ice surface uh, do, doing testing. Have you seen improvements over the years in, in our infrastructure, or we, have we plateaued on our ability to go up and set up an ice camp and not only predict where the, 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 the lines are and the leads are going to be, but uh, actually staying up there for a meaningful amount of time to do science. Yeah, I think the, the predictive capabilities have improved tremendously, and, and, uh, and they have to because the ice is thinning. When I say there's ice there, mm -hmm. and, and the ice has declined in its extent, what it's really declined in is in its thickness. Mm -hmm. And so it's getting more and more difficult to find ice thick enough to support a permanent, not a permanent, a, a seasonal ice station, mm -hmm. uh, experiments like the Navy ISEX. But I think the, the remote sensing capability has gotten much better, and so that, that's balancing it. Um, I, I started long enough ago that, that it was kind of in the heyday of, of Navy support of Arctic infrastructure, and then I, I kind of lived through the decline, but I'm hoping we're seeing a resurgence. So, but I can't say we're back up to the levels of uh, support that we had a number of years ago. Matt, any comments? Yeah, it's difficult to get up there, <laughs> and especially from the U.S. side, right? You have to go, I mean, it's, you have to get your equipment. You usually stage out of Seward or, or Dutch Harbor, and it's hard to get. It's, it's, you know, five or six days just to get to the Arctic. It's much easier to go from Svalbard, it's a, and it's a, there's a big airport there, you can, and you're already at 79 North, so it's pretty nice to work up in that direction. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess the other thing to say, we have the opportunity to work over a longer time period there now um, because the ice is thinner. It's, it's not much fun. Um, so I went on a to recovery cruise of those moorings and we were up there all the way till Thanksgiving of 2020. It was dark and cold and not much fun, but you know the ship can, can get through the ice and you can do it. So the, the season is longer. So I think more people can, can get up there. And are you, are you seeing any uh, similar changes to the results of your research based on not only technology improvements allowing you to measure different things or different methods, but also uh, perhaps the environment changing? Well, um, so, uh, two things, I guess. The, the, the equipment has improved over the, past, over the number of years. Like our sound sources are much better. We were taking advantage of uh, the, the research that's been done on, or the development that's been done with seismic uh, uh, toad, toad sources. So they, they're very reliable, it's, for, it's great. Um, and, but yeah, the environment has changed quite a bit. I mean, and I haven't been going up there that long, you know, since 2006 or seven, but you, you just kind of look at the ice edge every year and it's, it's, it's gone way, way back. So it's, 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 it's very frightening. It might be longer than other folks here. Yeah, <laughs> I, when I think that, it's funny, yeah, because I, I don't think it's very long, but yeah, it's probably <laughs> longer than many of you. <laughs> so so uh, with, with, the, with the advances that you've described and your, your um, notion of an underwater GPS, do you think that's something you could resolve depth? 
Yeah, well, so it, you have the advantage if you have a vehicle, you can put a pressure sensor on it. It's, you know, you're already, it's, they're not that expensive. So you don't have to do, um, that's why I said, you can use two moorings and just, you know, triangulate if you know what side of the line of, be of bearing between the moorings is. You can figure, you know, you can do pretty well with just two moorings um, and a pressure sensor. So, and I think you'd want to rely on the pressure sensor to know your depth anyway. And, and what about any seasonal changes to, to either things that you're interested in measuring or performance of instruments? Are there, are there any seasonal uh, advantages or disadvantages? Um, yeah, it's, it, I think you need to be up there all year long. Uh, <laughs> I mean, things like, you know, if you're limited to only going up in July, August, September, you're missing, you know, most of what's happening, right? You know, when the ice opens up, the wind blows, and you get all this heat transfer from the water to the, you know, to the air. And you don't get that, you don't see that if you're not up there. And Dave, what about the air breathers of the world? Do, do you have seasonal changes of things that you can measure or care about or sensor performance? I mean, you know, the, the permafrost is getting affected by things, um, you know, so there's outgassing, there's sensors that you would like to be able to monitor uh, what's happening there, to be able to understand what, what the melting is like. Um, with the temperature, you know, as you said, the ba it's, ba it's batteries, I think, that are mostly affected by, you know, the mill standard for, for temperature operation for electronics is quite wide, is, is larger than the, than the temperature range in the Arctic, but the battery technology is what, what really does suffer. So, so we've heard uh, a little bit about the, the technologies and especially the materials advances we needed for, for batteries and other things, but um, so set aside the, the sparseness of the observations we have, both uh, above and under the water. What, what sort of environmental limitations uh, do you see as challenges that we can start to look at from a technological advancement standpoint to improve our ability to sense? It would be nice to be able to have, I mean, for, for data exfiltration, for example, to go to higher bandwidth and to go to higher frequency, if we can do that, we would be able to get more data out. But that does require a satellite network that's capable of doing that and transmitter technology that would be able to, uh, to accommodate that. Yeah, I, I remember we were uh, learning more about each other a few months ago, and, and uh, of course, Larry was out on a ship somewhere, uh, somewhere cold, and uh, we were having a lot of difficulty. <laughs> a little, a little difficulty com going. communication, so, uh, communicating. Yeah, I, but I, I, I would take this question, and, and, and even Dave's answer really comes back to the observations. I mean, we, you know, how, how can we protect, how, how can we manage what we don't know and understand? And so I think it, th this idea of environmental modeling has to come back to the observations. There, there's a a finite subset that we have to make and be able to make and have enough density to be able to cross that threshold to really have a, a robust model of any sort. And it, it sounds like some of your research will enable that, uh, Matt, from, from not only the observations but the ability to communicate long distances. Right, I just want to echo what, he's, what Larry's saying. I mean, what we're doing and I think what is establishing a baseline. It's already kind of too late. Things are changing so fast, but we're you know establishing something that's changing rapidly, uh, and building having a navigation system would, would let you you know put vehicles out and measure all kinds of things that we can't measure in you know in a way that maybe you could um, you know adaptively sense where you are and figure out okay something's interesting happening over here. I want to go over there. And there, there's, you know, all kinds of new sensors. Like I, I was hearing about eDNA e the other day. I mean, that's fantastic. You can see what's in, you know, what's living in the water, and you can um, get a baseline. Of, I mean, the Arctic is changing not just physically, but biologically too. So it's, it'd be great to do things like that. And, and from those biological changes, are are you seeing uh, acoustic differences? Are you, you hearing different sort of signals that are um, uh, not previously there? I, so we have not really focused on that, but we have, uh, actually there's an audience member who I worked with on a paper, we saw, bow, he saw, analyzed their signals and saw a bowhead whale much further north than we'd ever, than people had ever seen before. And so we don't really focus on that, but it's just obvious in some of the data that you collect that, that things are happening that you didn't, people don't expect. For, for navigation, for GPS, how extensive a network would you, would, would you if, if in, in a perfect world, how extensive a network would you, would you envision? Um, well, some of these signals go all the way across the Arctic, so you could, you know, I think you could get up there, it, maybe six systems would cover the entire Arctic, okay. something like that, six moorings. Six moorings. The hard part, I believe, would be powering them, and we've talked about batteries. Um, I'm not sure that batteries are the longest term solution. Mm -hmm. Cables, bringing power to the moorings, 
or perhaps uh, fuel cells might be another way. But you would have to get them to uh, last for more than, we, ours last for a year or maybe two years sometimes. Uh, you have to get them to last for five or some sort of like, like a satellite replacement type thing where you got to know what the GPS satellites are on a seven to 10 year schedule. You know, something like that would be. Well, they have the advantage that they can recharge. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Easily. Yeah. So, so the audience wants to know about money. Uh, and they, they specifically want to know what, what sort of uh, increases are, are we seeing in investment in the Arctic? Uh, and, and maybe I'll, I'll add on to that. Where should we be increasing our investment that's not happening? Okay, I, I can start because for the last probably 20 years, the biggest investment in Arctic, and I don't know, I know, I don't know if I call it research, but Arctic activity has been spurred on by the law of the sea treaty, which allows the coastal states, the five Arctic coastal states, to increase their region over which they have sovereign rights to the seafloor and subsurface if they demonstrate particular morphological characteristics. So this led to a number of cruises, uh, starting with Norway, uh, the US, Canada, Russia, um, and Denmark. Um, and that has increased the database tremendously because nobody goes up there and just maps. They'll go up and make other measurements too. But we're seeing that taper off now as people, as the countries uh, feel that they're finished for the most part with that needed mapping. How about you? Um, so you're, you're asking what kind of commitment we need to make. <clears throat> I, I think we need to, Yeah, I would like to see an increase in investment. <laughs> you know, you, we there, the things are happening. So, and th this is the only time that you're going to have a chance to do this because it's going to change, and you're not going to know what happened before. So, I, I don't know if I can put a number on things, but you know, uh, there's there's an opportunity to put in cables. I think that's a great idea, and not only would it help us, but it you know you could hang all kinds of other sensors off the cables and do other kinds of things. Yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. So from perhaps the both uh, above the ice and also below the sea perspective for, for, for all of us, uh, if, if we could drop some leave behind sensors up there today, what sort of things would we want to understand over the, the period of many years to come? You'd want, um, I guess I, I turned the question back on to, to the other panelists. Yeah, and I'll, 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 ch I'll chime in, and I, I wanna reinforce uh, Matt's comment about instrumented cables, I think, as a, as a very appropriate way to do it. Difficult politically, but, mm -hmm. but, but certainly a, a great first start. Um, there's no question the Arctic is the canary in the coal mine with respect to climate change. Things are happening three, four times faster up there than, than elsewhere. Um, and as I mentioned in, in my little presentation, I think the, the issue of global sea level rise is, is one that affects all of us mm -hmm. everywhere. And I think we need to really get a handle on what's going on with respect to changes in water masses and changes in flow patterns and what's causing the acceleration of uh, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Because when we understand that, it may help us understand what's gonna happen with the Antarctic ice sheet, which has even a greater potential threat for global sea level rise. So I think in the, in the near term, I would see as from a scientific perspective and a societal perspective, I think understanding uh, the changes in the Arctic water masses, understanding changes in the melting processes at the ice margins uh, are really key issues. From a strategic perspective, understanding the Arctic environment full stop, um, the operational environment is, is critical too because it's gonna become a much more focused area of interest. Certainly, Matt, any, any additional attributes that you'd love to see data on over, over a month? Well, yeah, certainly temperature, salinity, you know, flow, uh, or, or currents, I mean, those are all, you know. The, the thing is, these data, they live in an archive, and they don't, um, you don't, they're, they're not dead. They, they, people use them all the time to calibrate models, right? They, they learn how to run these giant models, and, and if you don't have data from years past, they, they, they can't do that. Mm -hmm. So you need to collect the data before the, the models can, can inform your decisions about how the, the future will go. And uh, so it's really important to, to get the, and those basic things are, are important. There's lots of other sensors, oxygen, and turbulence, and um, you know, the, the biological ones I measured. Just plain acoustics, to, uh, we didn't talk about that at all, but I, I talked about my signals, but I didn't talk about the ambient soundscape. So that is also changing. As the ice changes um, character, you know, it gets thinner. It, the way it sounds when it cracks changes. The uh, number of ships going up there changes. Uh, the 
Arctic and Soundscape. The whales, I've mentioned, are going further north, changes. So you can monitor all that, and it's all important. So that just playing acoustics as a, they call it, it's, it's what they call now an essential ocean variable that's been accepted in, um, mm -hmm. in, 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 Decade of ocean, in the UN decade of uh, the oceans, right? Can, yes. can you comment on then the impact on modeling and simulation? What's changed now? And how, it must be getting harder because of all the things that are happening. Uh, you, 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 oh, well, I suppose it is. You mean with all the changes? Yeah. With all the changes in the ambient. Yeah. Yeah, but they they get they the more data they get, the better they are. So and they're and they're. I mean, this is really they're great. You would think the computers and the modelers are. If you just let them run on their own, they they you know come up with their answers and they make pretty pictures. But the data is really what drives them to, you know, making make good predictions. And if and if you think about modeling. Think about having an impulse of change. Mm -hmm. It actually helps very much, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of the veracity of the, the model. In mm -hmm. terms of you know when it when it fails, you know right away that it fails, and uh, if you catch the response correctly. Uh, so I think a lot of the, the rapid change is is actually helping helping the modeling world. But I can see you know this would impact all the advances we're making in machine learning and artificial intelligence as well, you know, to look for trends in data, and especially very large, very, very long time data sets, so. And, and I, I don't know how many models we've looked at that don't. Until, until recently. So every year there would be what we call the Arctic Five meeting with the, the geologists, geophysicists, and, and diplomats and lawyers would get together and we'd exchange data and, and, and talk about approaches, um, but that all fell apart um, recently. Um, it's now the Arctic Four. And, and any specific data that, that you all have benefited from uh, sharing that you could that you could point out? I, I, can, I can certainly. Please. Um, yeah, no, the Canadians have shared all of their Arctic mapping data. We've shared ours. Uh, the U.S. data has always been made uh, publicly available, um, and uh, we've benefited tremendously from that sharing. Um, the Danes are starting to share their data. So again, the Arctic Four have been very cooperative, but. Um, again, we one one outlier. Yeah, and I, I'd submit the United States is, <coughs> I, I, I think, a pretty good share. Also, I had an opportunity to visit the National Ice Center recently, and, and they effectively put onto the web everything that they yeah. they learn and, uh, mm -hmm. and and effectively real time. And I think that's about as cooperative as you can get. That's right. So, uh, as far as understanding the drifts in the magnetic pole. Uh, what, what sort of effects do we see there? I, the short answer is yes, that, isn't, that is a problem. Uh, there's actually two magnetic poles, and uh, the maximum is not where you would think it would be, and it's been changing more rapidly over time. So inertial navigation systems that, that rely on, on magnetic data, that's, that's been an issue. So, and, and it's an incredibly difficult thing to model as well, so to, and to predict where it's, going to, where it's going to go. So yes, it's a concern. So our compasses are spinning, we're crossing the dateline every, every day, and uh, so it's, it's a fun problem. It's a miracle we know where we are. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, and uh, so we've 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 had uh, icebreakers in the United States fleet for a while, and and I'd suggest that we've had fewer than we they, we might want. Uh, can you talk about any limitations that's that's had on uh, our scientific progress? I think it's had tremendous limitations. We 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 have one dedicated Arctic icebreaker, one which is a medium class icebreaker. We have one heavy icebreaker that supports Antarctic. And uh, that, that's just, it's just not enough. It's a big ocean. And back to the sharing conversation, do we, do we see ourselves sharing with other nations and their icebreakers? Uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, NSF has uh, signed an MOU with uh, the government of Sweden, the icebreaker I showed in the picture is a Swedish icebreaker, Odin. And so US scientists can now write proposals to work on the Odin. Um, there has been more or less formal sharing in terms of uh, uh, working on the Korean icebreaker uh, and the German icebreaker. Um, so that is, that, that kind of sharing is happening. There is a, a international group of icebreaker operators from the science foundations that meet together to try to coordinate things. Um, but uh, we, we really don't hold up our, 
our share. So I, yeah. I'd love to continue this conversation, but we're, we're out of time. I think the takeaways uh, among many uh, to just briefly summarize is uh, navigation is hard, communication is hard, materials is hard, uh, access is hard. Uh, so any technological advancements uh, in, in resource them. sponsorship <laughs> is perhaps uh, moving the needle in the correct direction, and, and there's not a, a, bad, a bad investment. But again, we welcome continued conversations uh, during the break. Uh, or, or uh, with any of us individually as to, to where we can improve there. Uh, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us. And again, thank you to the audience for uh, such a, a well-rounded amount of questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs>